fucking up. People are changing. Humans are naturally conservative. Because we're humans. You grow up being told to work hard for what you got. You don't, you don't grow up being told you're going to get something because you just want it. You saying like you ain't got to work for it. We, we, we went, when I went in the store and I tried to get a Snickers and ain't had no money for it, I'm going to smack my hand, spit that Snickers back. You feel me? We can't afford that. You know what I'm saying? But Democrats, they say, hey, we give you everything for free. That ain't reality. Because nothing is free because we pay for everything with our taxes. They work for us. It was Donald Trump who woke me up, man. At first, when he was he was nominated and and he was elected, I was not a big fan. But to see the things he's done for the black community, to see the things he's done for America in particular, I'm a huge fan now. And he has my support four more years. And I'll be voting for Donald J. Trump. And, see you there. And, and when he told us, when he asked us, what the hell do we have to lose? I said, that is exactly right. right. Our schools are horrible. Our communities are horrible. We got to do something about we it. We have to do something about it. And he but, is. But I know with him, we're going to make a big change here in America. I think a lot of African Americans are waking up and they're coming to the realization that Trump is great for America. Trump has done so many fantastic things, not only for, you know, what you think the white people or the rich people, but for the black people, for the Asian people, for the Latino people, for everyone. He has done something amazing and he will keep doing things amazing. And when he is elected in 2020, he will continue to make this country better than it was before. It's easy to get excited about our president who is putting your <clears throat> needs first. And that's too often, too often something that we don't hear from the mainstream media, is the way he's trying to help America be the best that it can be. So it was fantastic to be there and, you know, just basically tell him thank you for standing up for us. Because we know that he takes a lot of, a lot of hits from the media for us, and we're, we're so happy to support him. You gotta love this man, man. He brings togetherness, man, and that's what it's about. Unity as Americans. America first, man. The media wants people to think that, you know, the black community hates Donald Trump, but that's not necessarily true. This event is proof, and I know you can say it's a small fraction of, you know, the black population, but they have family members and other people, friends who weren't able to come here that they, uh, they're ecstatic that they're here. I don't think they're gonna show this because they want to, like, let, oh, Trump is racist. They're not gonna show this because they, that's not a part of their narrative. They're going to want to ignore it and, and hope it goes away. That's how they that's how they deal with like an inconvenient uh, a fact. They, they'll bury it, they'll ignore it, or they'll twist it. Because they don't want to pretty much deal with the truth. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the conservative message resonates with black America. And, you know, as time continues to turn, uh, the Democrats are going to have to reckon with that eventually. The, the little coverage that it seems that we do get in this movement is that we're paid, that we're tokens, that we're not actually believing in the voices that are speaking and that we are being used and paid for by politicians. And that's so, couldn't be so far from the truth. But that is how they like to paint us, specifically black conservatives. They like to deem us as tokens. Instead of just telling the truth. It seems like they're so scared to tell the truth because they know like our community will wake up if they get the truth out there. The media for a long time has um, fooled the black community into believing uh, that Republicans are racist. But when we study our history, we find out that the re it was the Republicans that actually passed the first civil rights bill, and it was the Republicans that abolished slavery. And so now that we're starting to learn for ourselves and think for ourselves, um, you're going to see a lot of more black people voting for Republicans. It's growing every day. We see day. that on the ground every day. We see that on our social media every day. We interact with people every day that are waking up, that see this movement happening. You have black conservatives not being scared to come out here and show who they are anymore, and you're going to have a revolution of young kid, young children out there in the future. They won't be so young anymore, and they're going to be speaking their mind, and they're going to be speaking the truth, and they're going to be proud of who they are. Conservatives, you can't shut them down. You can't shut them down on the social media, and they will always be who they are. And we want all the smoke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You did that? Because you, you, pit, pit, pit like that, right? You think you can bully people to stop doing something, right? Call us coons, all them type of names, right? Usually people run into their little cubby holes after that. But I feel like we, it's a new movement now, and we want all the smoke. It's really clear. You feel me? Like Antifa, they keep bullying people because people allow themselves to get bullied. But see, the difference is we want all the smoke. Yep. You know what I'm saying? People told me not to wear the MAGA hat, so I bought the biggest MAGA hat. Then I bought a bigger one. So next time somebody say something to me, duh, common sense, a bigger one. It's simple math, really, when you put, put it all together. So I feel like we started a new movement, and it's a revolution, and uh, we want all the smoke. That's my message, period. My man says we want all the smoke. Dr. Thunder, how's it going, my brother? What's up, man? What's up? 
It's good to see you, man. It's, uh, it's good to get together one more time before the uh, holiday season rolls around and we at the end of the year. I know last time we talked, you you mentioned the Larry Elder, Uncle Tom documentary, and you just saw a clip there from uh, one of the deleted scenes, actually. Um, it's it's on UncleTom.com. It's also on Amazon Prime. Um, I wasn't able to get any footage from the actual documentary, but Larry Elder has on his YouTube channel. It's got like a 13 minute video where he's got some deleted scenes and watching the deleted, the, the deleted scenes, they're pretty faithful to the spirit of, of the, the documentary. If you watch the documentary, you'll recognize this is right along the lines of everything that they were saying in, in the actual documentary itself. So I'm gonna play some clips from that. Um, having followed up on that request, I want to, to go back and forth, man, and, and talk about this, talk about this documentary, man. Um, there's so much to say, but I, I think maybe the best way to proceed would be to um, maybe just play a few clips and we can use those clips as segues into talking about, you know, a lot of different things, how we do. You got any initial thoughts before we, before we get anything rolling? Yeah, well, the first, the first thing, and uh, of course, Larry is aware of this and, 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 the folks in the documentary are aware of this, but the term Uncle Tom, if someone was to call a black person an Uncle Tom, uh, as if they're saying that there's some sort of sellout, that they're a race trader, that they are, uh, you know, they're not a field Negro, they're a house Negro. You know, if that was the reference, then the reference is shows a lack of uh, understanding, you know, of where that term comes from. Uh, Uncle Tom actually partnered with the abolitionists to free the slaves. What is actually meant is Sambo. So the character Sambo is the actual quote unquote Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom is actually the hero. So that's that's one point to make uh, about that about that term. Uh, that's been said over and over and over. It just seems like the general public just still is unaware of of that fact. Yeah, I, I, and 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 that that does play a big theme, and and I I believe we're going to see in one of the clips where they kind of go into that a little bit, and we can come back to that. I'm going to go ahead and right out of the gate contextualize um, my contributions to this conversation with just um, a, a, a brief statement about where I stand on on or how I approach politics, because my initial impression when I watched this was it's clear that this is a red pill versus blue pill conversation, right? Um, we've heard people like Brandon Tatum, Candace Owens refer to this as kind of like a red pill movement or many of their fans and followers have referred to them as the red pill, red pill philosophy, at least on the political side of it. I know that term does get used as well with, with the manosphere and so forth, but it's clear that the perspective here is that the conservative side is the red pill, the liberal progressive side is the blue pill. And the message seems to be a combination of, A, let go of that Democratic blue pill and take the conservative red pill, or like, hey, stop harassing the people that are choosing to take the red pill. And I, I think it's interesting because I don't come at politics from being identified with a red pill story. Um, there was never a point in my life where I, I was taught to believe that the story of power begins with politicians. My, my parents at a very early age, they, they taught me that power begins with God. And as someone who was made in the image and likeness of God, it is expressed through you. And so the creative power of the individual has always been the starting point for change. You know, um, you and I have talked before about that story of Moses that was that was a story about how social change happens that change did not begin with pharaoh it didn't begin with the politician or the authority figures or the person who seemed to have all the power it began with the person who didn't really have a name 
didn't have any political clout, but had faith in God and had the willingness to follow a creative vision, the willingness to step on toes, the willingness to do something different. And so I never had a red pill moment in the sense that what my mother and father taught me to think about politics and power. You know, I had this moment where it's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I, I didn't have a Trump woke me up moment kind of thing. And, and you hear that phrase a lot. You hear that Trump woke me up kind of phrase. And so it, it's interesting to hear it from that perspective because we're, we're going to go through this, but 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 immediately I'm kind of like, okay, I, I really like the idea of, of questioning trust in politicians. I really love that idea of thinking about power in terms that are bigger than, hey, the Democrats are for us. But my initial impression is that it, it definitely seems to be in the direction of the red pill is instead of placing faith in Democrats as being the ones that are for us, let's place our faith in Trump or Republicans as being the ones that are for us. And I got to be honest and say my initial impression, my initial impression was, oh, is this another battle between black folks about which plantation we should live on, which master we should serve? That was my initial impression. Man. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's interesting because uh, neither party, at least modern iterations of them, have been particularly helpful to the problems in the black community. And, you know, what one, one issue that I have with the Uncle Tom documentary is that they're, they're celebrating Trump too much. I, I'm sorry. I, I can't, I, I can't get with that. They're, they're too much Trump is the savior, you know, um, uh, Jesse Lee Peterson calls him, you know, the great white hope, you know, uh, it's, it's too Lee much. Uh-uh. Uh <laughs> yeah. There's too, you know, there's too much, there's too much of that. I, I can't, I can't go there, you know. Now, have some of Trump's policies been beneficial to the black community? I would have to say yes, uh, in that as the unemployment rate went down in the black community, uh, that was its own sort of empowerment. But to sort of celebrate this dude like he's some kind of savior, I I'm sorry. The, I, I don't see politicians as saviors. That I, I never have. There's, there's one savior. His name's Jesus Christ. That's that's the one that I that I get with. I don't get with. I, I don't do the. You know, deifying, regular, <laughs> regular dudes. That's just not my. It's not my thing. And actually, not even regular dudes. Corrupt politicians. You know. Right. Okay. Now people are going to be upset because they think I just called Trump a, a corrupt politician. I, I'm actually saying that as a class of folks, generally, I consider politicians to be corrupt. Maybe not massively corrupt, but corrupt in these sort of, uh, you have to stretch the truth. You have to use a lot of hyperbole. You have to make a lot of promises. You're not necessarily going to follow through with those promises. And obviously, you know, right. black folks have really, have really suffered, you know, at the hands of politicians. You know, um, I think we can get into <laughs> some specifics about that a little later. But yeah, I, it had to be say, said that I, I dig the documentary but they're doing a little bit too much Trump worship in the documentary for me. And, and you know, something that you and I share as a sentiment, we talked a little bit about this in our uh, episode where we did the conversation about Ravi Zacharias is something that, that Ravi said is that anytime you can take another person's belief, you can mock it, make it look completely stupid and worthless. Chances are you don't understand that belief, nor do you understand the way people think. 
And it's so important to be able to, without, with, without descending into relativism, without descending into the denial of truth as something that exists independently of our personal preferences and tastes, it is important to retain our ability to watch anything, to read anything, to listen to anything and say, all right, here's something in here that we all need to know. Here's something in here that is immensely valuable. And here's something that I think is worthy of, of great criticism. And so I, 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 do, I do want to maintain that spirit. I don't want to come into this bashing it because I do want to look at it charitably and, and, and highlight what I think is, is commendable about it. And at the same time, I, I do think, think some of this context is important. But how about we proceed this way, man? I, I've got a few, few of these clips I chopped up. Let's just, let's just dive into them. And, and then let's, let's address what was said on the clips and our feelings about it. If you've not seen Uncle Tom, the movie that I executive produced, that Justin Malone directed, and that writer Ansel co-wrote, you're missing out. Just go to UncleTom.com. You know, if we had stuck everything we wanted in the film, it would have been a 10-hour film. We got a lot of outtakes. Here's one on the real origins of Uncle Tom. How, how could you be a black man posing? Because I'm not led by the nose. I think for myself. You think for yourself? The white man doesn't think for me. The black man doesn't think for me. I don't need Jesse Jackson, Al oh, Sharpton, and the rest of those clowns. So Trump ain't a clown? No, Trump is not a clown. He's a straight house. I think it's condescending to assume that because I'm a black man, I'm supposed to vote for a Democrat. Whether it's coming from the media telling me to do it or from a politician telling me to do it or even from another black person to tell me to do it. You can't on one hand say that you're against slavery, but then on the other hand, tell me how to vote, what to wear, how to speak, you know what I mean? How to live my life because black people are supposed to do these things. They're supposed to vote this way. They're supposed to talk this way. They're supposed to walk this way. They're supposed to uh, believe a certain thing because that's slavery. You can't say that you're against slavery, but then put me in a box and tell me that I, this is how I have to perform. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Boyce, uh, uh, you know, he's he talks about Boyce Watkins, right? Yeah, Dr. Boyce Watkins, he talks about B1. And it's something that he's saying that he's black first, but their conversation is black first, and then all other issues are downstream from that reality. Hmm. And although I don't know that I would necessarily classify myself as black first, I think that uh, I tend to agree with him in that he, he's not willing to just, because we're black, we're supposed to do the Democrat thing. And he's been very critical of things like the 94 crime bill, uh, which Biden, that's it's like signature legislation. Um, and as far as Kamala Harris, the, you know, and all of the, you know, black men that she, that she, you know, got locked up that she prosecuted um, for, you know, drug violations. And, and then it was, you know, questioned uh, on, you know, on, I can't remember which interview it was, but she was laughing about having smoked marijuana, but she was locking brothers up for that, you know. Uh, there's, there's this sort of idea that uh, because they're Democrats and because in mass black folks have have supported Democrats that we're supposed to just keep doing it and the, the, the problem is is we don't we don't get anything out of the deal. We, we don't get anything out of the deal and and right now hot off the presses is another example of us not getting anything. okay now, uh, there's aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement that, that I agree with, and then there's aspects of it that I do not, okay? However, 
uh, of a movement that that claims to represent black people as a primary consideration uh, they were celebrating they were celebrating victory when biden uh with when you know when the media announced that he was the president-elect and of course that was not true because he wasn't the president-elect until yesterday <laughs> but you know he was projected to be the president-elect uh, but when the media started doing that black lives matter was like yes we won so the victory was get in biden now the hot off the presses piece of information news is that uh, Biden and Kamala, they haven't sat down with Black Lives Matter for over 30 days. So here you go again. It's the same stuff, it's the same okie doke, you know? And uh, Watkins uses this analogy, which I, which, I, which I like. He uses an analogy about people owing, uh, you know, owing money. So like, for instance, it's like the Democrats, they still owe black people money, right? They still owe us money and they still haven't paid us back. And they're not telling us when they're going to pay us back. But we have this next election and this is the one that's really important. And I know we haven't paid you back. I know we made your promises. I know about the 94 crime bill. I know that, you know, I was locking brothers up in record numbers in LA County. I know all of that. And yeah, we still owe you in, in like this, but we got to get this guy out of here. And this is the most important thing ever, right? So then you basically put somebody else in there that, I, I, it's just, we, it's just, we're so gullible. We just, we just let, we just let this stuff happen to us over and over. And if you really want to get me excited, um, <laughs> we can start talking about how uh, a lot of the stuff that has been negative has been disproportionately negative to black men. And we don't really have, uh, we don't really have a, a, an advocate. I mean, no one's really advocating for us. We, you know, there's a lot of advocating for black women's issues. There's a lot of advocating for LGBTQ, those issues, but, you know, there's not a lot of advocating for issues for black men as represented by black men, you know, not, well, this is what you guys, you know, this is what you guys are going to want. No, ask black men what they want and then proceed to deliver those, those goods. Um, but yeah. So, if if I if I get what you're saying correctly, you're you're highlighting that one aspect of this documentary that you do like is that it's calling it's calling out the Democratic Party on this tendency to make lofty sounding promises to Black folks in the name of being the party of compassion in the name of being the, the the people of great empathy. But then when it comes time to deliver, there's silence, there's delay, there's denial, there's all sorts of, you know, obfuscation. But when it comes time to get the vote, um, those issues and causes get trumped out and mm -hmm. they say all the right things, do all the right things to keep that loyalty going, kind of like an abusive relationship, so to speak, right? Where um, exactly like a relationship. Yeah, like, like exactly. You like know, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we've taken so much abuse. I mean, again, I've said this a few times, but this ninety-four crime bill, man, that's not that's not some small issue. That's like a huge issue, and I don't know how you can take that for granted and just act like it's. You, you can just act like, oh, that's, you know, getting Trump out is much bigger of an issue. It's a much bigger issue than the 94 crime bill. I'm sorry. The 94 crime bill is much, 
was, <laughs> is much, uh, is a much bigger issue. Now, maybe you can say you don't like Trump's rhetoric. You don't like the stuff that he says. And at least it seems like there's at least some kind of lightweight racial something on whatever it is, is that he's saying. Okay. If, if that's your perception, that's fine. But in order to take Biden in, who his signature legislation was this legislation that has totally decimated black community and in particular had black men at its, as, their, as its primary target and not be able to sit down before the election to say, hey man, what are you going to do about this? And a matter of fact, here are issues. Here's a detailed list of issues that we have that we're concerned about. Every other group makes deals. Everybody else makes deals. For some reason, the black community is just taking stuff in good faith, is taking stuff um, on credit, right? And the credit is terrible with the Democratic Party. It is horrible. Now, at least the Democrats are willing to come to our communities, co go to our churches prior to an election. The Republicans don't even show up at all, right? So at least they have that going for them, but it just seems, it just seems so. It, the, the abusive relationship uh, is 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 a perfect uh, description of what's what's going on, because it's like, look, baby, I know, you know, I know I beat you up, but here's some flowers, and know that I'll never do it again. You know, and it's like, but then like. You know, the next day, he's, he's beating his wife up again. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I often say that if your if your thinking tends to be characterized in terms of um, binary options, then you're probably being programmed. And one one very powerful and positive aspect to this documentary sales pitches for conservatism aside is that it does it does point out just how powerful the programming can be how you can almost get people to accept anything no matter how self-defeating it is if you lock them into a pattern of thinking that says yeah but it's not as bad as this guy over here in other words if you if you have a sufficiently uh narrated villain you can get the world to accept anyone you want as the hero. And that's a very, that's a very tragic, sad thing. And what you're pointing out is there are a lot of promises that are made. There's a lot of rhetoric that is employed. And we, we often flock to these people and say, okay, you have my best interest in mind. And then no matter how many promises you break, no matter how many contradictions, you know, plague your campaigns, no matter how much hypocrisy we see, all you have to do is find a villain, the right kind of villain that pushes all of our buttons in the right sort of way and say, yeah, but no matter how many times I lie or betray you, I'll never be as worse as this guy. One of the things I said and in, in, in my, my I gave as an analogy in my interview with Larry Sharp is I said, you know, if, if two serial killers were running for president and the first serial killer had only killed six people and the other serial killer happened to kill eight, America would vote for the serial killer who kills six and they would say, well, at least he's not as bad as that guy. And, and, and we wouldn't we wouldn't question or challenge at a fundamental nature, at a fundamental level, the nature of a system that even puts us in a position where we have to talk ourselves into voting for serial killers. Right. And that that to me is a big part of the reason why why we're in this position. And I think. I think the reason why these things you're pointing out are not likely to be persuasive is because they don't change the fact 
that a really powerful narrative has been painted about the opposition, right? So, so, so you pointed out at least the Democrats come into our communities and they hold our babies and they take pictures with us. At least they come into our communities and you know they claim to know who our musicians are. They hang out with our entertainers and they 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 at least pretend to care about our concerns, right? And then like maybe Republicans might see that as a lost cause or just may not feel what whatever it may be. Well, that is actually enough. Unfortunately, that's actually enough, right? Because there's nothing you can point out about the hypocrisy of the people that come into our communities that's going to change the fact that the people on the other end of the pol political spectrum look like villains. It's, it's this idea that, unfortunately, it, it's the reason why Plato was suspicious of artists, by the way. Plato had this idea that that artists were very dangerous because although the philosophers cared about thinking of truth in, in propositional terms and making sure that propositions corresponded to reality, the, the artist had the ability to paint pictures that made the truth look boring or weak or bad. And they had the ability to paint pictures that made falsehood look interesting or cool. Um, and, and he warned society against that. And, and, and that's, that, that's what influenced his notion of like the philosopher kings or what have you. But Plato's political philosophy aside, there, there is a, a strong, there, there is an essence of truth in that, that, that we live in a society where the optics still shape people's philosophy more than a, a well-constructed epistemology. And I think that is something that this documentary highlights very well. And it can be hard to parcel those two things out. Like, legit criticisms that can be made about unearned loyalty that we tend to have towards people that say the right things versus a proposed solution about what we should do next. But whatever the proposed solution is, it's going to be hard to hear it because we're we're stuck in this, you know, success is not being as bad as that guy over there. So interesting stuff, man. L yeah. Let me dive into another. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add. Uh, one thing I thought that was positive also about the documentary is that they're pretty critical about uh, uh, Republicans in their unwillingness or, or lack of, you know, adequate, uh, you know, messaging to the black community, you know, for just absence and not even trying. I mean, they're very critical of that. Um, and so that's, I think that's a, that's a positive thing. And I think it's a real mistake that Republicans make by not being more aggressive about that. And you can use excuses if you want. You can say, well, you know, we're not received well. So that's why we don't do it. I say, okay, well, you can do that. And that's a, that's kind of like a convenient way out. But look, if you're if you're trying to get your hands dirty and you're trying to actually, you know, make a difference and actually try to you know change some hearts and minds and all of that, then you, you're going to have to be more assertive. Um, and there have been some unusual connections with aspects of the black community that Trump has been able to to make. And so maybe because of that, maybe a, a strategy that the Republicans use uh, will include, you know, more aggressive messaging to the black community. So we'll see. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you did get a question um, here from, from Greg. How are Republicans treated when they do come to, uh, quote unquote, your communities? Uh, and, and, I, and I think what you're saying speaks to that, like, you're not in denial of the fact that there may be some legit reasons to feel uncomfortable. But the question is, do you want to reach this group? And, and, and we can substitute any group for X here. It's, it, it's like in business, you, you can have the most fantastic reason in the world for why someone doesn't buy your product. And you can be right. But the fact is, they're not buying your product. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do you care? And if the answer is no, you're cool. You don't have to do anything different, right? If you don't care, you're cool. You don't have to do anything different. You just can't complain about not reaching that customer because you said you don't care. On the other hand, if you do care, then the onus is on you to figure them out. 
The onus is on you to figure out how to effectively sell your product in a way that's going to allow you to get what you say that you want. Right. And um, that's, right. Th that's what I love about the free market, by the way, because in entrepreneurship, we just don't have the opportunity to play the same games that that politicians and political parties can play. You know, like you will talk yourself into homelessness by holding on to your position of rightness as an explanation for why people don't buy your product. You got to bow down to the customer, man, and figure them out, figure out how to sell them. And I think I, I, I think I think there are a number of different demographics that can do a lot better at that. But I can't title this video reaction to Larry Elder's documentary if I don't play at least a couple of clips. So let me let me go to another one. <laughs> Can't, you you called me a nothing. nigger. You I called didn't call me you no Yes, nigger. you did. No, I didn't. You did. No, I didn't. But you can say that. That's his constitutional right. You. you know anything about the Constitution? House nigger. Nigger. I didn't call you a nigger. Oh, okay. That, that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, right. Uncle Tom. Right. Oh, is that right. Uncle Tom? Yeah. To call somebody an Uncle Tom is completely idiotic. Because if you've read Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, you'll see that Uncle Tom was actually a, a very good person. He did a lot of good things. He sacrificed on behalf of other slaves who were on the plantation. In many ways, it's there's there's a lot of dramatic irony at play with being called an Uncle Tom. When you use the term Uncle Tom to demean someone, being ignorant, not knowing the history of what Uncle Tom means, you know, you're you're literally just signifying the fact that you yourself are ignorant. After educating myself on the story of Uncle Tom and learning about Josiah Henson, he was a completely good person, completely opposite of what the black community thinks Uncle Tom is. Uncle Tom was the hero. <laughs> he was the hero. He was self-sacrificing. And ultimately, he paid the ultimate sacrifice for not ratting out the other slaves that had escaped. Uncle Tom was the hero of Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and nobody knows that, so they call us Uncle Toms to hurt us. And every time we get called, I just go, oof, you should read the book. A lot of black conservatives have kind of flipped the narrative on Uncle Tom. I mean, we embrace it. You know, we say, yeah. Yeah, that's me. I'll get into debates with people. They'll call me an Uncle Tom, and I'll say, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. It should be a badge of honor. I wear it as a badge of honor. I, I like to tell people I'm a proud Uncle Tom. This whole scenario is indicative of the problem with the black community. The man who's trying to save the black community is demonized, and the one who's damaging and destroying the black community, a lot of people don't even know him. They don't even know the demon in, the, in their own communities. But the one who's helping them they want to throw you away. You know what? You know, oh, go ahead. You, you know, one thing I, I wanted to say is about this idea of having symbolic victories. Okay, look, man. I, I don't want those symbolic victories. That's not what I want. I don't want. I want real victories. Okay, and what it seems like to me is that the black community historically has received so little and has been cheated and lied to so much that they are willing to accept things that are completely symbolic, but that don't represent any actual change, uh, rather than things that actually would create substantive change, but maybe the messaging is, is abrasive or harsh. Now, I think it's up to the people that are doing the messaging. It's up to them to change the messaging so that the messaging is palatable. But, you know, this whole idea of, you know, symbolic victories, I don't want a symbolic victory. I want a real victory. I, I, I mean, I don't even care about that kind of stuff. And, you know, and yeah, I'm going to say this, the whole first black this, first black that. Okay, you know, I'm not saying that that, that that is of no value, but I'd rather have someone that didn't look like me, but that actually was advocating for the things that I cared about and actually put that stuff as a priority. 
you know, than have somebody that looks like me, but they're doing the same stuff, you know, that historically have been done. It has been done to to our community. So, yeah, symbolic victories are not victories at all. I mean, it, it maybe it looks good, maybe it makes you feel good, but you know, you can't fold that money. That <laughs> it doesn't create anything positive. So. And, and symbolic victories are, are quite seductive because they, they are easily mistaken for signals that we are moving, moving in a positive direction. In other words, when you, uh, you know, when, when, when you do something like, let's say, uh, and, and this was actually a, a common thing during times of slavery, you, you take a, a realm where black people are either not respected or traditionally underrepresented and you hire a black person or you put a black person in charge or you give a black person a fancy title now that could go either way that could actually be a sign that we're moving in the right direction that that black people are making progress in that field and that we're developing competencies we're earning respect and and we're creating opportunities but that also was a tactic employed to convince people, see, everything's good, everything's okay. When you know, as a way of distracting people from all of the other like shady stuff that you're doing behind the scenes or promises that you're breaking and so forth. So these symbolic victories are very seductive, and it makes sense that they that they continue to be so effective. Um, because I'm so hard on on sales pitches for loyalty to politicians and political parties, I want to make sure I, I make an effort here to highlight something that I think was really good. One of my favorite quotes from that uh, excerpt we just played was where, where Brandon Tatum says, they don't even know the demon in their own communities. And, 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 and I love that metaphor because stay tuned if you're not religious, stay tuned, uh, where th there's a verse in the Bible that says that, that the adversary takes the form or has the ability to take the form as an angel of light. And the idea there is that Hating evil is easy. Recognizing evil is hard. And wherever evil advances itself, it does so by representing itself as that which is good. And, and Tatum highlights that powerfully here, that the things that bring us down, the things that cause us the most harm, as my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, the devil's never going to show up with a red suit on and a pitchfork being like, yo, what's up, everybody? I'm the devil. The devil is going to show up in a form that is customized for you, in a form that looks like virtue and looks like integrity. And, and this is why, unfortunately, man, Thomas Sowell continues to be one of the more underrated thinkers um, uh, in, 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 in our communities. But one of the things he, he says that, that, that I just love is we cannot evaluate policies or proposals based on the sincerity of people's intentions. But we have to base them on the actual results because that's how you distinguish virtue from vice. That's how you distinguish the good from bad. And man, like nothing is a greater sustainer of slavery than rhetoric that sounds like virtue, than, than devils that appear to be angels. And, and I think if if nothing else should be taken from this documentary, especially if you identify with the political opposition or if like me, you don't identify as a Republican or a conservative, identify as a voluntarist, hardcore, all the way down, turtles all the way down, freedom all the way down. Um, I, I think you should take away this idea that however, whatever side you align on, that you should test the spirits to see if they are God, of God, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, like, like you, should, you should evaluate people's rhetoric according to the results they produce to see if they are truly promoters of freedom. I, I, I just think that was a powerful moment. You wanna do a, um, you, want, you wanna, wanna go to the next clip? Yeah, let's go to the next clip. When someone and then, by the way, I'm like, they shouldn't automatically be perceived as caring, non-racist, non-bigoted. Most of my experiences of racialized dialogue in a negative way or in confrontations with white progressives who, 
who I guess hate me because they hate racism. Just yesterday, I got a message from a white lady saying that I was a disgrace to my race. It was odd to me that a white woman would declare me a disgrace to my race based on her own stereotypes and preconceived notions of what minorities should think. They sell this idea of tolerance and inclusivity and we love everyone and everyone is welcome here, but no, that's not true. We are only welcome there if we believe exactly what you want us to believe. They will act as if for you to rebuff their overtures of sadness or apology is in itself the most despicable crime. It is because the modern yeah. white liberal needs you to be a victim. They have weaponized the notion of being a victim and various minorities have latched onto that and that has become the identity that they've taken on. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, that whole um, who has suffered the most thing is, I, I, what, why does that even matter? Like, why does that even matter? I mean, the goal should be to try to, to, try to bring everybody up or, you know, at least to give everyone equal access to the tools that can assist them in bringing themselves up, right? That that should be the goal. And so this sort of who's been the most oppressed competition is it, just a meaningless competition. Again, it's a way to make it seem like you care about the people that are oppressed while not actually doing anything that will help them. You know, um, you know, an example, a blatant example of something that I think on the, that it's a policy advocated by conservatives that would greatly help, uh, you know, the black community is schools of choice, right? So if you can send your kid to any school that you want to, and you're not limited to your geographical location, maybe you have to be in charge of getting your, your kid to the school, and that could be a challenge for some folks, but you know, you gotta take baby steps. It, with the constant talk about how bad the schools are in urban areas and how Black folks are disproportionately underserved by their educational institutions. Okay, we can fix that. Schools of choice, the money follows the kid, wherever you want to take the kid, you know, where, wherever you can get the kid to school. And, and Black people actually are into that idea. But mm. <laughs> the Democrats are not. And so it's a it's a it's a, a clear example. It's a clear example of how by trying to serve other, you know, by having a sort of diffused intensity, um, you know, you put all of this stuff that's not related in the same bag, you know, LGBTQ, black, handicapped, you know, just just a bunch of stuff that doesn't isn't served by the same things. And then you dilute, further dilute the intensity. So then you can't actually fix any one particular issue. And that one issue could tremendously help black folks, but that's a conservative position. And so, so it, there's like this smoke screen, you know, that uh, it makes it hard to uh, I mean, if, if I come out, you know, I'm independent and honestly, I'm, I'm actually more and more, I'm starting to see myself as a, um, 
almost almost as a black nationalist almost there's certain things about that that i'm not quite on yet but i think just the idea of us building ourselves up first the sort of malcolm x you know approach um i think that's really important um and i and i see that virtually all of the issues that we have uh, are actually remnants, uh, not, not remnants, they're overtones, maybe not overtones, they're um, reverberations from forced integration. You know, we talk about slavery ad nauseum as being the, you know, the major contribution to the struggles in the black community. I think initially that's true, but most of those issues had gone away uh, prior to forced integration. I mean, you had a high marriage rate. You had, matter of fact, uh, black folks were married at a at a higher rate than white folks were. I mean, you had strong families. You had Black Wall Street. You had all of this, you know, resources that were collecting in the black community, and then the forced integration totally destroys that. And so that actually, I think, is the issue. And, and until we can get back to really address that and have politicians that are willing to actually focus on the specific issues with a priority, with the most important thing, this being the most important thing, the issues in the black community, those issues are never going to go away. One clarification question. How, how does your position differ from merely, or I, don't, I shouldn't say merely, but how does your position differ from simply being an individualist who happens to prioritize the advocacy of uh, concerns in the black community through voluntary means? I, I don't know that there is a, a, a difference. I don't know that there is a difference in in what you just said may be a better a more clear articulation of what my actual position is because there is some uh some baggage associated with black nationalism that i don't know that i want to carry that bag um sure you know but i think the way you just put it actually allows me to still basically think what i think but you know just package it in a different way yeah. So going back to your earlier point, and we can we can dive into that more in the future. I, I want to hear more about your your journey on that. Um, one one of the things that that you highlighted really well was this idea of of how we we look at certain ideas as um, inherently uh, connected to a, a particular political philosophy, uh, and so we and, and so we, we instead of reacting to the idea itself. We react to the political party we think someone is representing when they when they espouse the idea and, and it hinders our ability to listen and, and evaluate all our options. And the school choice thing was was one that you you gave as an example. And I, I actually think although we have not seen a um, a perfect implementation of like the voucher system or school school choice. We haven't seen a perfect implementation of the public schooling system either. We haven't seen that system deliver on on all of its promises or live up to its ideals. And I definitely think that's a discussion that should be had more. Here's here's my version of that in the reverse. It's not a, a policy, but it's a it's a way of looking at a word. W one one thing I think is interesting is throughout this documentary. And, and, and I, I find this to be, um, this to occur quite frequently in discussions with, with, with conservatives is the term victim. Uh, the term victim is, is, in treat, is treated almost entirely as bad, right? Like you, you should never accept as true some proposition if the implication thereof is that it makes you a victim. And I think it's so important that this idea isn't sold too hard because there is, there is there is value for freedom that is lost if we just dismiss that term victim as bad and we allow it to be monopolized by people who promote a victim mindset. I get the whole thing about a victim mindset, living as if you have no power. I get that that's unhealthy. But the term victim 
and it has been used this way for a very long time, also means a person harmed, injured, or killed as a result of a crime, accident, or other event or action. And I think it's something, something that is very important for anybody who cares about freedom is that we understand whether you are positive about it or not, you are a victim if your individual rights are being violated, right? So if somebody breaks into your house and steals all your stuff, somebody puts their hands on you, you know, what I mean? somebody takes a shot at you, you're a victim of a crime. That doesn't mean you have to have a victim mindset. You might be the most positive dude on the planet. And the reason this is important to me is because whenever you are trying to persuade someone, it's very important to acknowledge what's right about their position, even if it's just something very small. And I think something that gets overlooked in these discussions that a lot of people who feel like victims, they're actually right about something. They're just wrong about who's to blame because there are people in this country and black folks are a part of that who are being screwed over. And if we just like move too quickly past the notion that you're being victimized, we might miss out on a very wonderful, liberating, enlightening opportunity to see exactly who is screwing you over. You know, as a voluntarist, I believe the machinations of the state are oppressive and systemically so. And there are a lot of things that are done for our well being that actually hinder us in so many ways. And many of us are very positive about it and we've got fantastic attitudes and we work very hard and we take responsibility for everything, but we are victims, you know, um, in terms of being abused by the state and having our individual rights violated by the state. I, I think an important aspect of personal responsibility is that you don't allow yourself to be manipulated by taking personal, by taking responsibility for things that you're not responsible for. You know, like if you go rob a store, and do it in my name, I'm not taking responsibility for that. I'm calling you out on wrong that you did. And, and, and I think this is another aspect of like, every time we hear the word victim, we kind of get triggered into thinking that, oh, using that word in any sense whatsoever means I have to endorse a mindset of self-defeat, government takes care of me. We miss out on an important revelation. And that is, we are all victims of the state in some kind of way. And if we truly want to fight our freedom, we have to recognize when our individual rights are being violated, even if we have a positive attitude about it. Hey, bro, um, I, I know you probably got something to say, but there's one clip I got to play before we before we close, because I want to know what you would do if you were in this situation. So let's play the next clip and then we'll we'll try to wrap up. This, uh, this next clip has, um, it's a moment with Marianne Williamson and uh, <laughs> it, it's something that happens in a church. Speaking of church. All right, give me one second. I'll play this. All right. Ah, come on. I'm having a tech difficulty real quick. <sighs> All right, it should be, I have, I think it's video number four. Yeah, play video four. All right, you know what, man, I cannot play this clip. Um, for some, so whatever reason, I, I thought I had it downloaded, but let, let, let me let me quickly explain it to you, man. Th there was a scene where Marianne Williamson was in a church and um, she basically had um, all the black folks stand up and or, or she, she said those who want to participate. And um, and then she had um, and you had, you know, different black folks standing up and then she had white people, um, you know, essentially turn to the black people and began to apologize. I wish I could play this clip so bad. This is my favorite part. Yeah, but she yeah. had all the way to apologize to, to black folks. And, um, and and one of the guys was, was commenting on the documentary. He was criticizing this, saying that this is condescending. It was actually one of the more powerful, interesting moments in, in, in this. 
and and he was saying how condescending it was and how like basically embarrassing it was. And and I, I want to know from you, man, if you were in that church when that moment goes down, all right, man, do, do you stand up? Do you walk out? What do you do? How do you feel about that? Yeah, there's there's a I, I like the Office, you know, the show The Office, and Stanley is the you know he's the uh, you know kind of he's a big guy, he's one of the salesmen. It's black, and uh, you know he has kind of a uh, an interesting sort of uh, sharp kind of way that he that he speaks. Uh, when he does, he doesn't say much, but when he does say something, it's you know. So anyhow, uh, you know, he says uh, someone's trying to cheer him up. And he says, I'll smack you in the face with a rainbow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone was trying to tell him that the, uh, you know, it was nice out and everything, you know, something is, you know, positive and like this. He says, I'll smack you in the face with a rainbow. <laughs> and I, I would, I would smack her in the face with a rainbow. That's, that's, that's how I, feel. <laughs> that's how I feel about that, man. I would be so offended if someone tried to force people to apologize to me hmm. first of all it's like it's not even a real apology because they don't even know my hmm. story they don't know anything about me and this whole quote unquote white privilege and all of that stuff it's actually just seems condescending it's like we are the chosen and because we are so chosen, it is we're taking it upon ourselves to apologize to you. <laughs> it's like putting themselves in some kind of superior position. And I think that white liberals don't realize how like condescending, you know, that is. And because, you know, all of us have have immutable characteristics that give us some sort of advantage for what it is that our true purpose is, right? So, you know, I'm a black man. Um, I have, uh, you know, you know, I'm, I have a lot of natural ability associated with music. I'm intelligent. Um, you know, uh, I have good genes for working out, which which uh, which makes me strong. You know, I'm hardy, right? I, I'm, I'm resistant to getting sick. Uh, I mean, there's a long list of things, you know. I had two parents that are still married, celebrating 51 years of marriage. Uh, there's a long list of things. And yeah, sure, I've taken some, some hits. And there's probably been people that, because they were racist, they did stuff that they thought was going to keep me down or whatever. Um, but... The, but but the thing is is that it, you know you apologizing to me and you didn't really have a stake in whatever the persecution was it's just it's just like dude I, I smack him in the face with a rainbow that's that's all I have to say okay I found the clip so let's play it still all right all right I can change a bigot faster than I can a patronizing liberal. I'm going to now lead us in an apology from white Americans to African Americans on behalf of our country, um, to you and to your ancestors and uh, to all of your people. So to the African Americans in the room who would uh, wish and be willing to participate in this, please stand up. I saw a clip of Marianne Williamson where she had a bunch of white people. And now I'd like to ask white Americans who are sitting near you. Stand around Please black people in this church and, and repeat this solemn chant of I'm sorry basically for all the atrocities that my people committed against you. On behalf of myself and on behalf of my country. <laughs> to you and all African Americans. I don't understand the fetishization of victimhood that white progressives want to put on to the African-American community. It's like, how dare you 
think that you are in a level of society where I am. You need to believe in the myth of whiteness and privilege. You need to understand that you're just not going to be as good as I am in society. For all the oppression and all of the injustices, I apologize. That's what the white progressive burden is. And it's weird. I, I, I will never understand it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it best. He said that one of the most difficult human phenomena to confront is not malice, because malice you can confront with violence. It's folly. It's when someone is doing something that they believe to be in your interest. And the more you say to them, you're strangling me to death. Oh, but I love you. <laughs> there you go, man. I, I had to. I had to play that. I thought that was such an interesting scene to watch. I mean, I, I heard what you have to say about it, and uh, I, I definitely hear what you're saying on that one. You know, it's it's interesting because I think there are more nuanced discussions to be had about race relations in America, even about the topic of systemic racism. And I was actually quite hopeful earlier in the year that we would get to, to a lot of those nuanced discussions. There are some people that are having them. I don't want to make it sound like I don't acknowledge that. But it felt like a lot of it just got lumped into the same old political left versus right talking points. Um, but I, I think the distinction that you, you capture in your criticism is that there's a difference between feeling guilt over your whiteness and feeling a sense of passion for black excellence. I think in a voluntary society, it's perfectly fine to focus on advocating for any group whose success, whose problems resonate strongly with you. I, I, I do not think at all that there's anything about voluntarism or individualism that precludes this, right? If, if you feel like, you know what, man, um, the problem that that bothers me the most is domestic violence. The problem that bothers me the most are ones that affect little children. The problems that bother me the most are the ones that affect women, the ones that affect Hispanic folks, the ones that affect black folks, whatever it may be. But you are not dealing with those problems through the mere sensation of guilt about your ontological state. And I think there is this culture of emotion equal ethics you know, this culture of having the right emotional response to something that you dislike counts as an effort made towards making things better. And I feel like there are a lot of people out there because I, I don't believe it's all I don't believe everything is accounted for in terms of conspiracy, although I, I, I do think there is such a thing as conspiracy. But perhaps that's another episode. But I don't think everything is accounted for in those terms. And I believe there are sincere, well-meaning people who genuinely do uh, feel some sort of sympathy for the suffering of others. And when they, when they do things like this, I believe there are people who, when they do rituals like this, they, they actually mean well. But this brings us back to Sowell's point about judging things, not by rhetoric, but by results. Judging things, not by your emotional response, but by the actual outcomes. And you know, if someone were looking to make my life better, <laughs> you know, I would say I'm not so sure an apology for anything is really going to do it. I, I, I personally don't even place a lot of value in it uh, when people do me do, do something wrong to me. It just doesn't do a whole lot for me. I mean, it's useful to know that perhaps you didn't intend it. Perhaps that's that's useful. But other than that, you know, um, it's, it's always been really easy to say I'm sorry. I, I think there's just a difference between fighting for individual rights, fighting for freedom. And the reason a lot of stuff like this thrives is because it's a lot more difficult to figure out how we fight for individual rights. That's, that's, that's a very complicated issue. It requires us to think critically and creatively um, at, at a level that demands self-honesty. But anyway, man, I, I, I wish we could go on. I mean, we, we, we may have to come back and... Here, I do, I do want to play this. This is just for context. I didn't hear it. Did you hear it? You didn't hear it? No. Uh, no. Well, it was the slap you in the face with with the rainbow <laughs> clip. But that's all right. Oh, we God. can we can we can get that another time. <laughs> and let me let me just shout out some comments, man, because I you know, I always encourage people to comment and and 
you know, ask questions or, or express thoughts or whatever. So I'm, I'm going to go down the list and, and, and address some. I have from Darius, although both parties have their flaws, the Democrats are clearly the worser choice. Republicans did not create the Detroits and Baltimores. Um, I mean, for me, for me on that one, Darius, uh, you know, Thunder, that, that, that may be a comment you want to handle. For me, Darius, I mean, even if you prevent, presented me with some kind of argument that says this party is better than that party, um, it doesn't change for me that the, the most important battle is not between left, right, or Republican, Democrat. It's between uh, choice, creativity versus coercion. It's freedom versus force. Uh, it's voluntariness versus violence. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready and willing and passionate about criticizing any party, even if they are the better party who endorses violence. If you're a serial killer that's killed less than all the other serial killers, I don't wanna praise you for that. I just wanna hold you accountable for the, the killings that you have performed. And I wanna to try to reduce that number. So I'm, I'm all about freedom. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a political party guy. I'm a voluntarist guy. And so I, I, I rarely find any meaning at all in, um, and, and, and trying to figure out which group is better. Um, I just like to criticize them both where they're the enemies of freedom. And I like to acknowledge what we can learn from both wherever they happen to uh, champion freedom. Thunder, you wanna say anything about that comment? Yeah, the, the lesser of two evils still ends up with you promoting evil. Yeah, that's my feeling on it, man. Uh, Greg says, uh, Joe Biden to Charlemagne the God, if you don't know whether to vote for me or Trump, then you ain't black. Yeah, I remember that. I, I actually, you can find a video of me on YouTube on, on an episode of The Minimalist talking about my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, you know, that's just the kind of statement that you make when uh, when you're not afraid of being held accountable and when you when you take people for granted. So it says a lot about the, the power that the freedom and power that people feel when, um, when when you allow them to take your loyalty for granted. We have from John. I, I think John was responding to you. I, when, when you were actually citing voice. I don't think you were expressing your thoughts on it, but you were citing voice where you said black black first. Uh, John says black first is wrong. Race first is wrong, black or not. Uh, thoughts on that, Thunder? Uh, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's a a uh, it's a matter of prioritizing intensity towards particular issues. So, for instance, like uh, the I think the parent analogy is is good. Now, I only have one kid, but what my dad tells me <laughs> and what people that have more than one kid say is that each kid doesn't need the same thing, right? Some kids need more time. Some kids need more intensity in certain areas. Other kids are, you don't need to do very much, you know, um, it just depends on the particular kid and you have to acknowledge that they're different and you have to treat them the way that they need to be treated to uh, to thrive. And in this situation, uh, when I say B1, Black first, I'm saying that Black folks, uh, you know, Black, <laughs> black folks that need a lot more uh, from this system than we've been getting, um, if the system is going to actually help us improve. Now, obviously, you know, even in saying that, I think really what we need is uh, uh, we need to be empowered ourselves. We need to take responsibility ourselves. You know, black agency. We need to have that as the prior, as as the top thing. But if if political parties are going to be vying for our you know attention, if they're going to be trying to get our votes, then we have to at least make them give us something that actually is valuable and get away from these, uh, you know, symbolic victories because it symbolic victories don't help anybody. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing I'll add to it is I, I don't think that the freedom philosophy uh, precludes having uh, prioritizing one issue, one group over the other. It's, it's simply about making sure that it all occurs within the context of freedom. So, um, Part of why we need freedom 
is because we don't all care about the same things. We don't all have the same priorities. We aren't willing to uh, allot uh, our time, energy, and resources towards the same causes equally. And you get to focus on whatever causes you want. I get to focus on whatever causes I want, no matter what group I'm putting first, but it's don't violate my individual rights. I won't violate yours. As Larry Sharp once said, he says, uh, you can be as liberal as you want to be. You can be as conservative as you want to be, but don't use force to try to make me be as liberal and conservative as you, right? Like it's, it's, it's anything peaceful, you know, anything peaceful, but you know, we could do a whole episode on that. Just, just a few more. Um, Let's see here. Nathan says politicians promising that they can solve community problems without individual community members effort is the lie that too many fall for. First politician said violence in these communities is a leniency problem, uh, ban crime bills. Now politicians say the crime bills are the problem and they'll fix that too. Nothing will change until people look to themselves as the solution to their problems. Um, so I, I mostly agree with you. My, my whole MO is have more faith in in ourselves than in the politicians but i think there are many 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 people in in black communities that are working very hard to build up these communities that doesn't make for interesting news so that's not going to get you know high that's not going to be on the highlights right but there are a lot of black folks across the political spectrum that are in the communities working hard to build the communities I, I think we have to separate the willingness to work hard from the, the necessity of having healthy skepticism because we can work really hard in our own communities, but if we don't have healthy skepticism towards everyone who claims to be showing up for our well-being, then we can involve the efforts of others who might undermine our work, you know, uh, who might negate the power of our work. And that's why I think it's important that we don't become authoritarians who, um, uh, uncritically trust uh, politicians without holding them accountable to results and without treating them as as any other kind of individual, not not treating this stuff like it's a religion. They are our employees, not our gods. And, and, and also the, the idea of working hard, uh, I know it's very tempting to associate the conservatives and Republicans as being the, you know, the party of people that want to, you know, work hard. And the other party is the party that doesn't want to work. You know, they just want stuff given to them. And, and that, that's just false. That's completely false. Um, uh, all the folks that I know, uh, all the, you know, liberal, you know, progressive leaning uh, folks that I know, they're, you know, they're virtually all hard workers. Um, so that's just not something that's true. And, and, and by the way, that's that's the difference between getting your view of reality from engagement with real people than uh, getting it from social media interaction. I think there's a kind of inflation that's happening on social media accounts where certain views seem to be more popular than they actually are. Certain attitudes and habits seem to be more popular than they actually are. And that's not to dismiss the, the legitimacy of certain concerns with cultural shifts and so on. But I think when you get out there and, and you engage the real world, you find that most people out there are not committing crimes. They're working hard. They're trying to survive. They're trying to take, you know, um, take care of their families. But they also are, you know, have an easy time buying into political claims that that purport to to have their best interest in mind. And, and that can lead to a lot of danger. Hey, man, I wish I could go on. We're way over time. I got to stop. Tune in next time, man. Tune in next time. Uh, th this is the last one for the year, but we plan on doing more. But uh, thanks for everybody for giving comments, for giving questions. Continue to do it because we do come back afterwards and read these. And sometimes we're able to incorporate things into the next show. But hey, keep living freely in whatever way you can. And don't forget to enjoy your freedom while you fight for it. Peace.